Impact of Educational Leadership. This is part four. I'm your host, Isaiah Drone the Third. Tonight, we have Professor Jeff Willie. Professor Jeff Willie is uh, he's an executive director with the John Maxwell team, specializing in personal growth and leadership development. Professor Willie is an educational consultant, a conflict resolution trainer, mediator, with over 30 years in conflict mediation, and a former facilitator of Franklin Covey, Seven Habits of Effective People. Professor Willie currently travels, presenting high-level church, school, leadership, and personal growth workshops throughout the United States and throughout parts of West Africa. Professor Willie is married to his high school sweetheart, Pat, for over 42 years. They've been married and they have two daughters, Dr. Katrina Willie Musoma, she's a pediatrician, and uh, Ursula Willie, she's an attorney, and one grandson, Nathan, our, our next guest is the uh, incomparable Dr. Dorothea Walter, originally from the Bronx, New York, and Los Angeles area in California. Dr. Walter obtained a Bachelor's of Science and Business Administration from the University of Albany. Uh, her Master's uh, is in Psychology from the uh, UOP, University of Phoenix, and a PhD from Grand Canyon University. Dr. Walter is also a licensed life coach. Uh, she's also a dissertation content expert and a doctoral tutor. Uh, she mentors uh, many, many uh, people working on their uh, dissertations and um, doctorates and thesis. She uh, also has served for 25 years in the airline industry. And Dr. Walter is the president of the Broken Easter Healing Foundation, where she is heavily engaged in community activities uh, all throughout California, uh, Texas, and New York. She also travels, presenting high-level workshops and training in the United States and abroad. She has been the keynote speaker at several universities and religious organizations in Africa. Uh, Dr. Walter and Dr. Willie, say hello to the people. Hello. Great being here this evening. Hello. It is absolutely my pleasure. I'm very humbled to be part of this continuation of this podcast, and certainly uh, my, my thanks to you, uh, Dr. Drone, for inviting myself and Dr. Walter to be part of what you are doing and how you're reaching out to the community. So I am forever blessed because of your leadership. All right, all right. Well, listen, we I'm so excited. I cannot wait. We've been talking. We've been going back and forth. We've been researching, and and now here we are. Now we have it. Um, so let's go ahead and get started here. Now, um, every successful organization needs effective leaders to increase commitment commitment levels of the employees and their job satisfaction. Professor Jeff Willie, describe to us describe educational commitment and the way it affects students' learning. I, uh, Dr. Drone and uh, Dr. Walter, what a <clears throat> phenomenal way to start this discussion out. And uh, you have definitely um, touched on a very, very emotional, sensitive topic in regards to the commitment. And it said effective leaders increase commitment of the employees, uh, level of the employees and job satisfaction. And now we, you want to segue that into educational commitment and to student success and student learning outcomes. There's a former president by the name of Theodore Roosevelt that he came up with this quote many, many years ago, and I'll just quote, try to quote it directly, but it says, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. 
that's in every aspect of life, whether you're in the educational realm, uh, whether you're in the job market, whether you're in religious organizations, or in a nonprofit. And people don't know, they don't care how much you know until they know that you care. The art of communicating and connecting with people, that is key components of dealing with relationships and connecting with students. Significantly important that you're able to connect with students. And you'll see a lot of things that, that's uh, surfacing right now in trying to build those relationships. And I'm going to quote from a book that I had part in taking place, kept writing in a few minutes, uh, a book by the book, an author by the name of Larry Davis, and I was a contributor to the book. And the name of the title of the book is The Re-Education of the African-American Child in Today's School Society. And I'm going to give you a couple things that I, that I actually added to the, the content of the book. But you probably saw, you've probably been around education long enough to realize that there's an emerging thing about the relationships. Relationships are really important. I'll, t- I'll touch on that in a minute. But there's a couple of our, um, what I call workshops and certifications that I have under my portfolio. And one of those is Capturing Kids' Hearts. Capturing Kids' Heart, the founder of that is a uh, psychologist by the name of Flip Flippin out of College Station, Texas. And he travels around the globe with his team of facilitators going into students, going into schools, and working on capturing kids' hearts. How do you capture kids' hearts? Because remember, I am not going to learn from someone that I don't like. I am not going to learn from someone that don't like me. You, you, you might think so, but in essence, you are not reaching your full potential uh, in that classroom or in a relationship if there's not a liking or care for that person. And a person know when you care. No matter how much you articulate the lesson plan in that classroom, if that student don't know that you care for them, they're not listening. They are tuned out, and they are thinking about the person that do care for them. And so Capturing Kids Hearts has done a wonderful job. I've actually attended the training as a, as in a student, and then I actually attended certification training as a trained trainer back in December of 2016. Got a chance to meet that, that phenomenal faculty and staff in College Station that travels around this country and going into schools. And a lot of the schools in the Dallas Fort Worth area has, has that program in their schools. And there was another one that I uh, actually visited, went to Atlanta back in October 2016. It's called Time to Teach. How do you get that time back? to be able to manage that classroom. The shift is we're teaching teachers not only to manage the classroom, but we teach them to be proactive leaders in that classroom is to establish the parameters and establish those guidelines, those expectations, high expectations, because all students can learn, but they know when you don't have hope in them. If you have hope in them and you hold, hold them for high expectations, they will learn, and you have to always believe that. Students can learn, no matter what their current situation, their social, economic challenge, their background, the current things that are, that are going on in their home or the environment. If you build a relationship with them, you can capture their heart. You can get back that time to teach them. The book that I want to talk about, it comes out of the, um, the, uh, the re-education of the African-American child. And one of the R's that comes out, I'm going to talk about a couple things in that, and I'm going to probably end with my words. One of the first things that come out of the R's is relationships. You have to build a relationship. Get to know your students. I, you, you want to spend a couple of days not on lecture. You want to get, you want to get the relationship connected first. Maslow hierarchy of needs. You want to work on Maslow before you deal with the taxonomy, taxonomy because that, that relationship, Maslow was about relationships and knowing that person so you got to build those relationships. You got to recognize that person as a human being and respect them and, then, and also set a, a parameter of responsibility, in other words, empowerment and trust. And you got to set to have the resources available for those students to learn. And sometimes those students come to your classroom, uh, come to those classrooms, and they haven't eaten. Uh, there are they are social economic challenges at home. Sometimes they might not qualify for a free or reduced lunch. You, as an educator, and that campus, as educators, leaders, you must recognize that. And I think our current system right now is doing a much better job in connecting with our students and challenging them. And so. That comes out of that. One of the things that out of this is that uh, we need teachers who like children. 
Now, you would think that would be automatic. <laughs> that would be automatic. But let me to tell you, that's not automatic. We need teachers who like children. There are some educators that do not like children. And some, and that's part of their rite of passage. That's a legacy in their family. Their grandmother, grandfather were educators. Their parents were educators, and they thought this was the thing that was right for me. So I became educators. And so this is part of my education, abstract from my education philosophy that I have. It's written in this book, and I have it as well as part of my education philosophy. Connecting with students is a major part of student learning. Connecting with students will open them up to believe and receive. Once students know you care, I have credibility or you have credibility. See, sometimes students may be required to take my class. They don't mean they desire to be in my class if I haven't connected with them. And then once I connect with those students, the paradigm takes place. Student achievement increases. Educators must set those high expectations and model and reinforce those expectations in a positive manner, not in a negative manner. Everything reinforcement can be, must be positive because if you reinforce it in a negative way, you are disenfranchising that young man or woman. So the relationship must be positive. It has to be positive. You can tell a son or daughter or a young person in your room to correct their behavior in a very, very positive way. It takes practice. It takes a commitment to loving your children. It takes a commitment on those educational leaders, loving those teachers, and it can be reinforced, and it must be reinforced in a positive way. Positive is everlasting. Positives change lives. Significant of positive, that should be your blood type. Be positive at all times. And so with that being said, I will end it there and, and we will go to the next question. Thank you. I hope I covered it very well. Yes. I mean, with that being said, I have to recap on, really quick, let me recap on that. Another way you connected students with uh, a foundation or a movement called Caps Caption. Caption Kids uh, Hearts. What is it called? Capturing Kids Hearts. Capturing Kids Hearts. Yeah, that's awesome because kids must know that you care. And, you know, I know you mentioned Maslow. I'm not going to go off into that. But, right. you know, connecting with students is something that, you know, the political gurus have failed to do. <laughs> and that there's a further complication in adversarial political systems uh, that, that uh, for instance, Barack Obama, you know, he, he caught on to that, you know, with, with the Yes, We Can movement. And I don't know if he came up with that, that, that that slogan or not, but he, he in fact used it and it was successful for his campaign in his first term. Office by virtue of party support and then, uh, you know, they, they end up, uh, giving, uh, the community back those demands, uh, that, that they need as far as their, their interests, like in the community and, and things that you were talking about in the classroom and, and how we teach. And I think personally, uh, that's a great point, you know, connecting with students, because if the employees can connect more with students and students know that they care, then that would, I think, give about or bring about more, or that would, that would heighten or that would increase the performance output. Dr. Walter, let me ask you a question. I, and I kind of want to tie that in to what Dr. Williams was saying here. Uh, so, so Dr. Walter, how do employees identify their job and their job environments as it, uh, as it impacts on employees' motivation, performance, and commitment? Well, um, let me make sure that I've got the gist of what you're asking me. You're asking me whether the workplace environment affects workers' motivation, their performance, and ultimately their organizational commitment to their company. Is that correct? I'm speaking, I guess I'm pulling from your psychological uh, expertise. How do they identify, or how do employees identify with their job environment as it relates to uh, their motivation and their commitments with their okay yeah okay um, well I'm glad you asked me because you know when I was completing my um, my research for my PhD I focused on quality of work life and organizational 
uh, organizational commitment. So I'm very excited to speak on this topic. You know, uh, quality of work life is huge nowadays. Uh, first, let me just elaborate a little bit about what quality of work life is. And please keep in mind that in the past, uh, quality of work life was not always a concern of many business owners. You know, years ago, many businesses are mainly concerned with their bottom line, not so much their employee satisfaction, and it didn't matter, you know, whether they had a family uh, or how hard they worked or whether they were happy in their positions. It was just productivity that mattered. So in, as far as quality of work life, Walton's theory originated back in the 70s, and it identified several items considered important to employees in their overall job satisfaction. He believed that, you know, uh, quality of work life meant more than just meeting the needs of, of you know, meeting the needs of satisfaction by a 40-hour 40 work, 40 work week and workman's comp laws. And for time's sake, I'm only going to mention a few which I believe are relevant today, such as adequate and fair compensation, a safe and healthy work environment, the development of human capacities, and, and growth and security. But that was then. So fast forward to the 21st century, and quality of work life has been redefined to center around the well-being of employees, a safe and healthy work environment, the development of human cap uh, capabilities that include job and growth and security. The definition, you know, has changed somewhat and redefined as an attempt to encourage working in an environment that maintains and upholds fulfillment by affording and fulfillment by affording employees with rewards, job security, opportunities for growth. And here I believe, Isaiah, the operative word here is fulfillment, meaning can the organization fulfill the employee's every need? Nowadays, fulfillment can make for happy employees. Many organizations today are diligently trying to achieve that delicate blend of work life and home life for their employees. They've come up with pretty effective quality of work life programs that are truly based on the working environment of employees and their employees. Here's the thing. Business owners have finally come to realize that a relationship between worker satisfaction and productivity and dissatisfaction and no productivity, they actually exist. They finally realized that in order to maintain or to improve productivity in the workplace, they must have what we refer to as happy employees, which leads me now to organizational commitment as a result of positive work environments. And as far as organizational commitment is concerned, however, an employee's organizational commitment may be based on many factors. These factors are very personal to each and every organization and its workplace environment. That would go for you, for me, for uh, Professor Woolley, or whatever. One theory that I examined when I was completing my own research in this, in this arena was uh, Port, Porter et al.'s uh, Satisfaction to Commitment Mediation Model that was penned in 1974. And OC was defined as, or organizational commitment, was defined as the strength of an individual's identification with and involvement in a particular organization, and it was based on three factors. The first factor was a strong belief in and acceptance of the organization's goals and values. The second one, was a willingness to exert considerable effort on behalf of the organization. And the third one was a definite desire to maintain organizational membership, or in other words, they want, if they wanted to stay with the, the organization, they would do everything within, their, within their, their, their realm in order to survive and to, to stay in that organization. Therefore, uh, what I would say is organizational commitment was largely based on the employee's perception, which related to their own personal quality of work life. So in closing, and you know, to answer your question as far as quality of work life and organizational commitment are concerned, what I've amassed is that if a goal of the organization is to be successful, then the corporation must realize that it is necessary 
to emphasize job satisfaction because it could in turn affect turnover and productivity. Basically, what I think is quality of work life does in fact affect employees' organizational commitment. There's, there's a definite relationship between the two, which I proved in my study. So I hope you, I hope you found this uh, interesting topic for you. Uh, can I, I will call in the wow. Uh, yes, I, please, because I got something to say too. Go ahead. Man, I, my goodness, uh, 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 Dr. Rita, you just had me on the edge of my seat. I kid you not. Ma'am, I got some notes here as well. Uh, just listening to you talk, and my, <laughs> my, my mind was just spinning back and forth, and I became a visionary of seeing organizations that I've been associated with, the organizations that I've actually trained, and, uh, and listen to all those things about job satisfaction and relationships. And I, one of the key things I heard about all of this it was that R word, that relationship. That was, seemed to be a yeah. common thread of everything that I, that, that I heard from you. And just about everything that I've said, everything that you have said, I'm, I'm, I'm picking up exactly. this common thread is the R word, and that's relationship. And that relationship, is exactly. A major key component and understanding. You know, I think Stephen Covey, um, one of his statements, uh, he said, seek first to understand and be still be understood, which is one of his seven habits. Listen to understand other people. So that's what I picked out of that. Because every, each, each, of, each of us are different. And as an, as an exactly. employer, it's a response to meet, my, meet me, not to meet the we, – we are all not in the same basket. We are all individuals, and I heard that all works. So that's, that's, those my, that's my follow-up, and I thank you for that. That was so enlightening. Well, thank you. Oh, it was. I can continue your thoughts. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But when you said – when you start talking about happy employees – you start talking about the factors in the workplace environment, and you start talking about models that, that they have used that work and that don't work. And the first thing that came to me was the SWOT analysis, you know, and that's, you know, the strengths, the weaknesses, opportunities, trends, and threats. And I was like, okay, so now that has to be tied into the quality work life, right, as it right. Uh, relates to vision, okay? as it relates to confidence and as it relates to confidence. Because vision, I'm just backtracking here real quick, uh, a leader, every leader has to have vision. They gotta know where they're going, right? And yeah. with the vision, they have to, they have to manage, right, people's competency, meaning their gifts, right, and their intellect or their intelligence. What is this person gifted at doing? What is this person intelligent doing? And then getting those people to train each other. You know, I'm, I'm a, you're gifted in doing this right here, and this person is kind of weak in this area. So this, these models have to come in place to, to strengthen or tighten the, the loose ends. Does that make Am I making sense? Yeah. When I'm connecting what you're saying, Isaiah, that uh, each, of, each one of us have our lane. And it's up to the employer to know what our lanes are. I need to work in my strength zone, uh, not in my weak zone. My most productivity is going to take place in my strength zone. And in and, uh, and the areas that I'm not best at, then i got someone else going to work in that strength zone. So that becomes a form of delegation and releasing uh, my weak zone allows someone that's, got, that's stronger in an area to be able to work that. So we have to know what our particular roles are in our organizations. In order for the vision to manifest itself, we have to stay, we have to walk and work in our roles. And when I, when I work in my strength zone, my job satisfaction go up because I am I feel comfortable in my strength zone versus right. my weak zone. I feel level of anxiety exists when I'm trying to work in my uh, like the ambiguity is taking place. You're not sharing enough information with me, so I'm I'm stressed, and so my job satisfaction is de de decreased. And once I'm confident, along with confidence, I'm in my strength zone, so my job satisfaction and my productivity goes up. Exactly. <laughs> That's hot. This also this, this what we talked about a couple of weeks ago with leadership uh -huh. and and basically you know not all people are good teachers and, and can lead at the same time so you have to find an individual strength and you must build upon those strengths because if you don't then how is that going to help your organization you hired that person for a reason so what was it, what quality was it that I saw in that individual when I hired that individual? Maybe I'm not allowing them to spread their wings, if you know what I mean. So mm -hmm. it depends on the leadership as well. 
That was so good. And that actually that brings with that being said, that brings us to our next question. And this is like tied in, I think. Really, really Oh my uh, goodness. It's a tight knit, sir. It's a tight knit. Actually I'm mean, actually since since you sound so excited, I'm gonna ask you the next question here, Professor Willie. <laughs> what <laughs> what are the major <laughs> see? <laughs> Uh, what are the major issues uh, you've seen emerging in educational leadership practices in order to uh, improve human society as a whole? Okay, and I got five, and I'm going to read you the, the, the um, preemptive paragraph, and then I'll get into my five that talks about that. And it's just going to just exaggerate on the if what Dr. Walter has said. It's just going to highlight what we've all, this is kind of a culmination. It might not be the end, but it's certainly all tied in together. And it, it talks about this, and this part of my leadership philosophy. Uh, if you want to look at it, Jeff Willis leadership philosophy. Whether you are a leader in your home, and see, that's, that's Dr. Tony Evans made a profound statement. I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Tony Evans. He's a <clears throat> local pastor here at the uh, uh, radio broadcaster and just a phenomenal man and and uh, said if you want if you want better nations you if you want a better world with better nations I'm paraphrasing of course uh, with better states populated better cities better neighborhoods better churches and schools better families and then I must become a better person. And I paraphrase that. I have to go and pull it up, but I, I must become a better person. And I can say we collectively, but still, I need to look in the mirror and say, I need to become a better person. So it goes to my, uh, goes to my, my, uh, my leadership philosophy. When I'm a leader in my home, my school, my church, or my business, my leadership is not about me. My leadership is to service to mankind, a calling larger than me. I sacrifice my leadership, my man, for the needs of others. I accept responsibility for my actions and make no excuses for my shortcomings. I seek and obtain personal and professional knowledge and skills and continue to enhance those skills in my particular field of studies. See, I can't add value to others unless I'm adding value to myself. And so here are my five. Leaders are people focus. Leaders are visionaries. Leaders foster a growth mindset environment. Leaders encourage rewards and risk taking. Leaders respect and develop a product productive relationship with each member of their team. Great leaders know the way and great leaders show the way. And that's my summation. That's Jeff Willis' leadership philosophy. That's what I focus on consistently, intentionally, and try to employ that and apply that daily is to add value to others. As I add value to myself and emerging right now, especially with working with my educators leaders, with my education, ed, excuse me, I apologize, with my educational leaders, and I am trying to shift that paradigm because most educational leaders operate autonomously. They operate on the island, and we're trying to build, build that team. Uh, my workshop right now is the 17 indisputable laws of teamwork, trying to bring that together. They cannot operate. There's no such thing as an I in team. One cannot accomplish greatness. We can only accomplish greatness. And that emerging right now, if you look at some of the other uh, things that educational leaders are doing, that's what they're coming together and trying to understand that because the cost of the value of our community and the value of our leaders, which are our children. I, I don't like saying the children are the leaders of tomorrow. Uh, the children are the leaders of today because tomorrow is not promised. We only hope for tomorrow. So we have to be in, empowering them to make decisions, to take risks today. That's Jeff Willis education philosophy. That's what I see merging. That's what I'm out there promoting through my John Maxwell and leadership development. That's when I go into churches. That's what I'm focusing on. I'm teaching those leaders to grow leaders, not to grow followers, to grow leaders. 
you have so much drive. Both of you, both of you do uh, have so much drive, and that is. I'm glad you brought that up because that is a problem that I see. I see leaders. Uh, leaders need to understand that you cannot lead in isolation. I mean, you have to, but you have to respond appropriately to the needs of the of the people, which means you have to be touching them, right? You got to be shoulder to shoulder. You got to be arm to arm, hand to hand. You have to get your hands dirty. I'm sorry. Away with all these clean hand handed leaders. Okay, you have to roll those sleeves up sometimes. <laughs> And go out there and connect with people. You're going to have to connect. How? I mean, because they know if you're authentic. You know, they know they know if you care about them. That goes back to what you're saying. People know that you care by when, when you get involved. When you get involved, then they know that you care. And this is how you serve mankind, right? By caring and getting involved and, and actually, you know, hand to hand. Uh, you know, and, and I, know, I love what you said, uh, leaders are people focused. Whenever you, because I believe hospitality is a gift, I believe generosity is a gift, okay? And whenever you use those gifts, okay, there is a reward. Every Christmas time, we go out and buy gifts for our loved ones. That is a reward to be able to buy your loved one, or it should be a reward to be able to go out and buy your loved one what they put on the Christmas list that year, right? And so uh, I love that. I really love that. I really love that. Dr. Walter, let's move to our next question. Dr. Uh-huh. Dr. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Don't kick it off all over that. I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Well, I just want to add this right quick because he said gifts. And uh, it, it, this is it right here. Your gifts are not about you. Leadership is not about you. Your purpose is not about you. A life of significance is about serving those who need your gifts, your leadership, and your purpose. Okay. That is so beautiful. Dr. Walker, do you have anything to say? Because I'm about to ask you a very hard question. I was just shaking, shaking my head in agreement. Yes, it's very, very true. Yes. You are preaching, sir. You are preaching. Yes, you are. <laughs> yes, you are. Well, I guess we need to take up an offer pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Walter. Yes. That brings me to my next question. Okay. How is organizational commitment? Because I know that's, that's one of your major fortes. And so okay. how is educational commitment for educators affected by, you ready for this? <laughs> I know. Yeah. I'm, to, I'm ready. I'm this ready. Is, it's loaded. It's I loaded. Hope so. <laughs> I hope so. How is it affected by, some people call it EI, but it's emotional intelligence? Well, let's see. Emotional intelligence <laughs> is, let, let, me, let me put it this way. It's how well an individual recognizes and monitors his or her own emotions as well as the emotion of others. Okay, let, 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 me try to, let me try to explain that. So fundamentally speaking, emotional intelligence influences his or her motivation and behavior, and this includes like four key elements such as that individual's self-awareness, that individual's self-management, social skills, and relationship management. Okay, uh, as far as, the, let's see, the, the field of education is in the business of educating our young. Okay, we're, they're essential for shaping their future. And so, with that being said, the young who we educate today or our future leaders of tomorrow. Does that make sense? I think so. Okay, so in the grand scheme of things, teachers are crucial to us in every way possible. That includes starting from parents as teachers in the home, pastors or deacons and mentors as teachers in the church, teachers and counselors in the schools. This also includes teachers in the community and within the neighborhood. Let's not forget those educators in the school of heart knocks. They should be included as well, you know. And so 
emotional intelligence, I think, for teachers is a huge part of that process. My understanding for EI or emotional intelligence in easy terms is described as, you know, an ability to understand one, one's own feelings. Okay, okay, and as a result can uh, lead to the individual's fulfillment. And as far as teachers' emotional intelligence is concerned, there is no difference in this field for teachers as with any other denture, uh, in industry, per se. Look, when we examine the correlation between teachers' emotional intelligence and organizational commitment, the same ideas are applicable and based on factors that I previously mentioned, such as the need to stay within an organization. The employers in this case are the school districts and the principals of the school. The field of education is not exempt because education itself is a business. In this case, uh, the same factors I mentioned before are applicable and very personal to each and every teacher. However, not each and every teacher will be satisfied or dissatisfied when it comes to the district, the school, or principal for that matter, or that principal's belief. I believe um, it truly depends on the depth of the individual teacher and his or her own emotional influence. And you know, I passively mentioned one word a, a little while ago, a few moments ago, which was fulfillment. And I realized that that particular word can be, sit, uh, can be considered the elephant in the room. Fulfillment means to that individual, can the organization fulfill the employee's every need? Fulfillment meaning by giving teachers excellent and increased salary, by offering job security, by providing them with supplies for which they need to teach by providing them with a safe and protected environment, particularly nowadays, by rewarding them for their successes and accomplishments with students who some considered never had a chance by affording them opportunities for growth in their careers. So it, 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 there's no difference, really. My friends, let me say, nowadays, fulfillment can make for happy employees. We're going back to happy employees now. It's personal to them meaning did that teacher make a difference in at least one child's life? If yes, then it's possible that that educationer, that education, educators, I'm sorry, emotional intelligence has been satisfied, thus leading to organizational commitment, okay? So organizational commitment, therefore, is largely based on employees' perception, which relates to their own quality of work life. That, I believe, Mr. Dr. Isaiah, <laughs> that's the answer for organizational commitment for educated, educators. So in closing, to answer your question as far as emotional intelligence and organizational commitment are concerned, is that if a goal of the corporation is to be successful, then the educational system must realize that it is necessary for an emphasis to be placed directly on the teacher's job satisfaction because it could turn, in fact, uh, it can, in effect, turnover and productivity. And that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> I hope that, that was so interesting. That was interesting. But it, it also was enlightening uh, because you know why I say that? It's another form of educational leadership. I mean, it's just like, it's like we're in the ring here, and it's like, you know, one glove says, my left glove says uh, educational, and my right glove says leadership, and it's like, boom, education, <laughs> boom, leadership, <laughs> educational leadership, yes. and that really knocked me out the ring. Yeah, and so that really knocked me out the ring, you know, <laughs> because, okay. you know, okay. right, and it's like, you know, because we come from the school of hard knots when it comes to yeah. education. Because now our kids have been so dumbed down, right, by technology. And I know we talked about this last week, how you measure education with right. technology in the mix. Well, you got to do assessments. But also with that, you have to, some researchers have even quoted some of the researchers, you know, that they've suggested that now 
it takes kids. Now I'm not trying to offend anybody, but it says that takes kids like 70 iterations of telling them the same thing in repetition before they actually understand it. So if you're telling a kid to, example, put up your phones, put up your phones, it, it could take up to 70 times before they get it and they actually put up their phones. So that helps us out, right, as far as being educated because, you know, hey, I'm not going to – you know, I'm not going to flip my top into the 70th time, right? So I know I got yeah. 70 times before I just get totally frustrated and say, hey, put up your phone, right? Because I know now because of technology, right, because of cell phones, it takes them a longer time to understand. Right. right. There's a couple of things I, I like to um, I share with the uh, what, what uh, Dr. Walter said in, uh, in regards to uh, that um, satisfaction and education commitment. And uh, I'm not sure exactly who came up with this quote. I have to go back and dig it out, but it just came to my mind uh, while she was talking. And it said, if, if, if you don't feed the teachers, they will eat the kids. And, and <laughs> that's and almost that's like growing up in New York. You get eaten, or you, you eat, or you get eaten alive. Yes, you I get eaten alive, and, and, and <laughs> yeah. that, that, that meaning is that the educators, those leaders, must take care of those must take care of those teachers. Those teachers are at the front line every day, and, right. and they are those parents are not keeping their best kids at home. They're sending, they're sending to school what they have. And those teachers need to be supported, need to be cared for, and that leader or that campus leader must be responsible for taking care of that, for those teachers to take care of those students. That's got to be that connection. That's got to be the focus. My job as an educational leader and leader on that campus would be to take care. And, and you've heard this before, too. The customer knows best. The customer is always right. You've heard that in businesses. And sometimes, whatever the customer says, you've probably heard that before. But guess what? If you don't take care of that cash register, if you don't take care of that greeter at the front door, if you don't take care of that person that's stocking the aisle or helping you try on that pair of shoes, if you don't take care of those people and you're concerned about your bottom line, you won't have a bottom line until you take care of those people. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, well, so that, that, yeah, that, that's, that, that's, that's where I take on that. I, I, I really look at the, those levels of taking, of serving people. You have to serve that person. I have to serve my client and my, uh, my employees and so they can serve the customer. Because if they're happy, and they're going to smile when a, when a customer walks in the door. Exactly. exactly. That is so true. Mm -hmm. That is so Very true. true. Very mm -hmm. true. Well, with that being, you know, with that being said, what are your takeaways? Because apparently, time has slipped past us, and we're out of time. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> who wants to go first? Who wants to go? No, 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 no. That was excellent. Who wants to go first? Would you like to, Doctor? I can go first, Doctor Walter, if you don't mind. No, you can go ahead. Well, you can go ahead. Yes, um, uh, Doctor Drone, you said that uh, one of the things I've noticed about what we do, and and just being able to listen to uh, Doctor Walter. We are very passionate about what we do, and I'm passionate about what yes. our subject is. And it's not about us. We are passionate right. about it because we want to use it to serve others. Exactly. People connection and relationship. That's why we are passionate about what we do. That's why we have so much energy. That's why I get excited about what I do and get in really enthusiastic about this panel to be able to share what's on my heart because I do, mm -hmm. my focus is that other folks are going to listen to this and they will be blessed by it and they will be changed by it and, and they are become better. If I can impact one person, uh, I'm good. I'm okay. I won't impact a lot. But I'm certainly, if I can change one, and then one may be the set of thousands of flights. Mm -hmm. And that's where I am with that. So, Dr. Walter, Dr. Drone, I really appreciate you guys allowing me. And I'm oh, we appreciate you. Part of this. Oh, I definitely appreciate you. Definitely. Yeah, we, we, we both appreciate both of you guys as well. And, and you know, and you are excited. Uh, I remember uh, you you've been calling me 
out the hood here, uh, Professor Willie, and I've been like, okay, this is Professor Willie. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, Dr. Roger, what, what, what are your takeaways from tonight? <laughs> Are you talking to me? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Yeah, yes, that's the one. What's your takeaway for tonight? I, you know, I've, I've gotten a lot of insight from Professor Willard and yourself as well. And um, my, um, my, my feeling is that it's very similar to Dr. Willard, that if I can change just one person's ideas or one person's, you know, influence one person's life, then I've done something worthwhile. And I'm hoping that 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 I can continue to live up to that. And, um, you know, like I said, I, I, I come from the South Bronx. And so to be in a position to be able to help or to be able to give back in that capacity, that's what I'm, I'm all for. So if I can change one person, there are many people who contributed to, to, you know, to my becoming a success. So I'm hoping that I, in turn, can do the same for someone else.